This video is brought to you by World of Tanks. You muppet. Hey Noble Ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metafron speaking and today we're going to review two types of medieval helmets, the Frogmouth Helm and the Armit, which also happen to be my favourite. As usual, this will be done in a comparative key. Most importantly, during this video we'll reveal some information and make some propositions that many of you might be hearing here for the first time. Among other things, I'll also be challenging some established facts. I shall then proceed to defend my thesis. YouTube content creator, best job ever! The medieval knight is one of the most compelling symbols of the Middle Ages. Now, whether it be the highly romanticized hero of literary conventions imbued in moral certitude, or whether it be the brutal and often morally ambiguous champion of a highly warlike and political age, both hyperbolic figures have a point of congruence, their armor. From a medieval perspective, armor is not just protective equipment, armor is status. It's a personal identifier. In a way, it's an expression of conceit. All of this needs to be kept in mind as we assess and discuss the shapes and designs of these helmets. An armet is a close-fitting helmet shaped to the head that has two hinged chick pieces, one on each side. This achieves two things. One, the entire lower part of the face opens to permit getting the helmet on and off. Two, when it's closed, it provides a very close fit to the wearer's head. This makes it one of the most anatomically shaped helmets, if you will. We are in medieval Europe, and the bassinet helm typology is rising in popularity. Within this context, the armet starts being developed in Italy as a further improved shape in comparison to the bassinet design. The idea being the medieval Italian armorers were experimenting with ways to make the helmet more close-fitting to the actual human form. When you put on a bassinet type helmet, you put it on top of your head and you slide it down into place. The same can be said for a lot of medieval types of helmets. Even particularly simple ones like this one, you just put it on. Anatomically speaking, this means that the bottom opening can never be smaller in circumference than the largest part of your head, namely the brow. In other words, we're talking about the parietal bones, which are bilateral bones that form the superior and lateral walls of the cranium. You'll notice that the head curves down into your temples, becoming narrower and narrower, reaching the jaw and below the chin and neck. So for a helmet to fit closely, it requires a mechanism that would allow you to open it and close it back up. Overcoming this anatomical discrepancy, which we see in previous helmets, that required a wide, fixed opening at the bottom. Now everything we've been speaking so far is the established facts. One thing I'd like to do for the next point is to bring up my challenge to some of these established facts, and I will do that after a brief word from our sponsor. But now I would like to take a moment to mention the sponsor that made this video possible, World of Tanks. World of Tanks is an intuitive online multiplayer game that is free to play on PC with more than 100 million players worldwide. With over 800 unique tanks, including destroyers, artillery, light, medium and heavy tanks, World of Tanks is fully customizable to your play style. As for me, I'm a heavy tank guy, as you can imagine. Earn experience, modify and upgrade your tank to create an unstoppable beast of steel. I'm not talking about you, mate. Not everything is about you. The game has a wide range of locations for its matches. You can play in more than 40 unique arenas, deserts, forests, urban areas and even industrial zones. The game is inspired of historical tanks which makes it feel authentic and fun. Download World of Tanks for free today by using the link in the description and use this special code TANKMANIA during registration to get a free 7 days of premium account, 250,000 credits, the premium tank Excelsior and 3 rental tanks for 10 battles each. Tiger 131, Cromwell B and T3485M. Get into the game today and begin your journey to become the most powerful player. And big thanks to World of Tanks for sponsoring my video. Even though I agree that the design of early armets most likely started with bassinets in mind as a sort of starting point, the closing mechanism itself, the overall idea of two separate articulated sections that connect at the front, is not medieval and it's not a new design. It's much more ancient than that. In fact, it's ancient Roman. Look at this type of Roman auxiliary helmet specifically for cavalry, 2nd century. Notice anything? 
Look at the closing mechanism at the chin. See how the two cheek blades overlap into each other and are secured. It's very reminiscent of armor designs. I understand that armets are a sort of evolutionary step that begins at bassinets, but is it possible that this ancient Roman mechanism is in fact the precursor of such tech? We're gonna brush through the fact that the armet was in fact invented in Italy and we justify it with the idea of, well, Italian armorers were very productive and they were very active at this time. But perhaps the very fact that the armet was invented in Italy was no coincidence at all. They were very familiar with this type of closing mechanism because it was ancient Roman and it was over a thousand years old and maybe they are just bringing it back, something they were very familiar with. Could there be a deeper connection? Is it plausible to think that Italian armorers were well aware of this specific design and decided to re-implement it back in action in the 15th century as need arose? Also keeping in mind that the classical period and ancient Rome is a lot closer to the medieval period than it is to us. In my opinion, it's a reinstallment, not a discovery. Having a close-fitting helmet has the following advantages. The amount of metal required is equal to the amount of metal needed to cover the head. Hence, it's an optimized design. It grants excellent protection in the sense that it has a more uniform protection and it creates less gaps that could be exploited by your enemy. It is also harder to remove and when it comes to the armet itself, once the wrapper plate is in place, it becomes even harder to take off. We'll get to what the wrapper is in a minute. Not that one. But wasn't I just listing the advantages? How is it an advantage that it's harder to remove? Well, it is an advantage because you're not the only one who might want to remove your helmet. Your enemy is also interested in removing your helmet if occasion presents itself. King Richard III, anyone? Do you know how Richard III died? If you don't, it's gonna be my next video, so stay tuned. But seriously, if your opponent has numerical superiority and you've been surrounded and someone tries to remove the helmet from you, well, good luck removing an armet. A very important thing to say is the Armet is a typology, it's an umbrella term, it's a whole category of helmets. When you look at early examples of armets, you'll notice that they have a tendency to have this sort of scoop out, bowl shaped front or lower part of the helmet. We don't only see these in iconography because you might think maybe it's just the artist who doesn't know how to draw. We also have a couple of extant examples, one of the most famous ones being the former Sherberg number no. 57, which is now in a private collection. Some armets also present breaths, which are punched on the plate of the helmet, but these are not very common in armets. And when they are present, they are rendered in asymmetrical construction. As a quick reminder, asymmetry in armor usually manifests itself on the right side, which is the most compromised side, as opposed to the left side, which is the better defended one. So if we do find breaths in early armets, they would be on the right side. That is because the left side of your armor, as you're facing a right-handed opponent, is the part that is more likely to receive a lance shot or a strike. Early armets also have veils, which allows the attachment of aventail. This might be further evidence that armets developed from the bassinet. Now, one of the greatest and more apparent advantages of an armet over a frog mouth is the presence of a visor. Having a visor during a battle allows you to do many things. You can lift it up for a moment and breathe, get some fresh air, perhaps look around. If you can disengage for a little bit, you could take refreshments and definitely cool yourself down. We know that knights even decided to engage in combat with their visors up during their battles, but of course, if at any time you feel that you want that extra protection because maybe you're going for a full charge or perhaps you see some enemy archers and crossbowmen, then you can always, boom, bring it back down. This is a great advantage over any forms of great helms, for example, whether it be the frog mouth or previous ones, because with something like this, you have to remove it completely. With a visored helmet, you can just lift the visor. Of course, you're losing part of your defense, but still the top of your head is protected and with an armet, even the lower part is protected. Armets had two different kinds of visors, either the complete one, so it's a full visor that you entirely lift up, or you also had visors that only included the lower section. In this case, the upper edge of the sides is formed by the lower part of the brow plate. So when you lift one of these half visors, only the lower part goes up the brow stays in place. Now this is an example of a 15th century full visor and of course it's a much more robust construction but as we move into the second half of the 15th century the majority of armets will only have the ones that have the lower edge without the top. 
those will become the standard for armets. This means that these kind of half visors were deemed to be a more than appropriate defense. Also, side pivots will become standard on an armet, similarly to how they are used on a bassinet to attach the visor. What's interesting is as you look at these side hinges for armets, you'll notice that they are covered by a flange. In most cases, they are hidden and protected. This probably tells us that they were worried that previous configurations could be broken and then the visor will be compromised. The first time that we see an armet in art is in 1410 and it's the very famous publication of Grandmaster Fiore dei Liberi called Fior di Battaglia. In the folios of this manuscript there are quite a few helmets that are clearly early examples of armets and this shouldn't surprise us because of course this manuscript was created in Italy, Fiore dei Liberi being an Italian Grandmaster. When it comes to the earliest known example of an armet on an effigy, I'd like to credit Ian Laspina from Knight Errant channel, we find it on this German effigy from 1416. So as we progress in time we see that armets start to have some defining characteristics that are typical of late 15th century and even early 16th century armets. First of all, the skull becomes more rounded and less bassinet-like, and also the front brow plate tends to be reinforced. The medial or central ridge in the top of armet starts to also become more pronounced. Later armets don't use the veils anymore and instead had a full-on set of segmented plates to further protect the throat. As I was hinting before, later armets do not present breaths but have solid plates. This specific choice makes sense because an armet is a heavy helmet and it's used for full-on cavalry operations. Now, there are a couple more points I'd like to make about the armet before moving to the frogmouth. We need to speak about the rondel, we need to speak about the wrapper, as I was mentioning, but there is something I want to see if you noticed. Did you notice that I didn't talk about a specific date? Oftentimes when we talk about helmets we say this helmet was in use from 1530 to 1640 and that kind of stuff. I decided to not do that on purpose. The reason being that another thing I'd like to propose is that we probably should stop having arbitrary and very specific dates when it comes to an helmet life of operation, if you will. And the reason why I'm saying this is, well, the following. Okay, noble knights and men at arms, it's in three, two, one. All right, welcome everyone, it's 1385. Please throw away all of your great helmets. From now on, we are all only using bassinets. We've got this beautiful example of a great bassinet. Who wants it for 500 pounds? It's a thousand pounds, a thousand pounds for the lady over there. A thousand and five hundred pounds for the blue knight. Okay, it's one, two, you muppet. I'm usually not a huge supporter of specific dates when it comes to helmets. I have used them in the past, but I have to say that the more I study this subject and the more I listen to very knowledgeable people, for example, Zach Evans, Matt Easton, Tobias Capwell, links in the description, I'm noticing that as modern people, we like having everything perfectly defined, but helmets don't really just disappear overnight, and these dates should just be considered as general indications. Okay, what the heck is a rondel? A rondel is a circular piece of metal used for protection, as part of a harness of plate armor. It can be attached to a helmet, a breastplate and several other locations. Rondels placed on the tail of armets are actually quite common. First and foremost they would provide extra protection to the occipital bone, so it's possible that they are there just in case someone tries to get a shot at you from the back. The wrapper is an additional plate that could be attached to an armet to provide extra protection in the front. In a way, we could say that a wrapper sort of transforms an armet into an almost frog mouth. You know, for those of you who are really uncertain and you're like, I don't know, I really like the frog mouth, but I also like the armet. Well, there you go, armet with wrapper. You got best of both worlds. Of course, the wrapper provides extra protection where you need it the most. It makes it specifically suitable for cavalry, but it also reduces your ability to move your head around. This can be seen as an advantage and a disadvantage in the sense that the disadvantageous aspect of this is the fact that if you need to look around, well now your head is blocked in place, so you're gonna have to move your torso a little bit. But a positive aspect is that if you do get struck in the face with a lance in full charge, well at least your head will not snap to the side, snap back and break your neck. Wrappers of course had an optional layer of protection, but many knights decided to wear them and others didn't. What would you choose? Would you choose to wear a wrapper with your armet or would you go for a little bit of a lighter configuration? Let me know in the comments below. And also make sure to subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Going back to the rondel, it's very likely that the rondel was also used to provide protection for the straps that were specifically used to connect the wrapper. So a rondel in combination with a wrapper provides protection to the leather straps and it allows the wrapper to stay very stable, acting as a pinpoint if you will. Because of course it goes without say that if someone managed 
manage to cut one of the straps then the wrapper could collapse and literally block your head in place in a way that would be even more awkward, compromising your helmet. When it comes to the cons of wearing an armet, well of course we're talking about on a helmet on the heavy side and of course the uh, general weight of armets will vary significantly. Armets in general are heavier helmets compared to for example a Salat and Bever combination which would be a lighter version and much more forgiving type of helmet. Also having such a close fitting helmet means that it can be very claustrophobic and it can be difficult to wear for a long period of time. In fact for people who are claustrophobic it could be completely impossible. They'd be like nope not for me. So it's not a helmet that is easy to wear. As a little fun fact slash rant, I'd like to also mention the closed helmet category. The closed helmet category is a helmet that, if you don't know the exact difference when it comes to terminology and nomenclature, the difference between a closed helmet and an armet, you might get them confused. Now the difference is actually quite simple, it's just a closing mechanism in the sense that if the fully enclosing helmet opens to the side with the cheek plates hinging up, that's an armet. Instead, if this lower plate is solid and it doesn't open like this, but it opens in the front, then it's a closed helmet. I'd like to underline though that this is just a modern diversification. It's modern nomenclature in the sense that it's very good because it helps us identify. If you just say armet and you mean everything, every type of closed helmet, then it kind of becomes difficult to be specific and precise. So this differentiation, it's very useful. It's great terminology, but please keep in mind that medieval people called all of these armets, including closed helmets. So in period, there was no difference between an armet and a closed helmet. They were all armets. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I've noticed people that sometimes get too pedantic about this in the sense that you'll say oh I really like armets and maybe you're showing a closed helmet and be like no that's not an armet it's a closed helmet. Mate they are all armets. Closed helmets is just to make it easy to explain ourselves let's not fixate on these small details. And of course also the Maximilian style of armor tends to use armets but they are fully fluted and I'll make a dedicated video to Maximilian armor. Okay, so now we are stepping into the latter and final part of this video and that's the section about the frog mouth. So what is a frog mouth? Well, a frog mouth helmet is a massive fully enclosing helmet that sort of ditches the idea of mobility in exchange of full-on protection. This, in fact, in my opinion, is the most protective helmet full stop. Differently from the armet, we see that it's not a close fitting helmet at all. Now, generally speaking, this kind of helmet is associated with the joust rather than with battlefield warfare. With that being said, it's also important to underline that perhaps we are stressing this point once again a bit too much, in the sense that iconography doesn't seem to support its idea that this was only used for jousting in all of its varieties. Now, don't get me wrong, there are specific frog mounts that are just designed for the joust. But there is a lot of medieval iconography that shows knights using these type of helmets on the battlefield. Now whether a frog mouth was also used in war or not is the sort of subject of a critical conversation within armor discourse, featuring several experts on both sides of the spectrum. On this video I'll present both arguments and I'll also share my personal opinion as an attempt to mediate. While the armet was a development of bassinets, the frog mouth helm is a development of early great helms. One of the points of development of this helmet compared to early great helms is the fact that the lower plate protrudes forward and it becomes quite thick. You'll also notice that the lower lip, let's call it this way, extends forward. This probably gives it one of the most dehumanizing looks when it comes to helmets. So yes, armets can look rather brutal and intimidating, but when it comes to intimidation, I think the frog mouth takes the cake. Now whenever I wear this helmet on this channel or on my TikTok, I notice that people immediately point out the lack of vision. People say, how can you even see from that thing? But the reality is that your vision is actually not too bad. It's not great and of course much of your lower vision is blocked by this plate, but your peripheral vision is still quite good. And interestingly enough, vision-wise, there isn't a huge difference between wearing a frog mouth and wearing a armet, particularly if it's a late one with no perforation and a wrapper on it. The main con when it comes to this helmet is the fact that it's even less versatile than an armet, in the sense that there is no visor, so the only way to get some fresh air, increase your visibility, drink something, is to remove it completely, unless it's raining. 
then I guess just stand still. But what you lose when it comes to versatility, you gain in extra protection, which is probably one of the reasons why these kind of helmets were very popular in the joust, where your chances of getting a lance in the face are quite high. I think one of the greatest proponents of this idea that Frogmouth might have been used during war is Augusto Boerbrandt at Magister Armorum. And I have to say that his ideas are very, very interesting. And the idea comes from the fact that we do see it in iconography all over the place. Now, of course, people could just say, well, it's probably just an artistic invention. But is it? We see this consistently throughout several centuries and in many different places. Whether it be Germany, whether it be France, whether it be Italy, these guys always appear. Now, of course, as you move forward in time, they will become rarer and rarer as the armor sort of kind of takes over these kind of helmets. But you always find the occasional knight that is wearing one of these. And sometimes they're not even knights. They're just a random man at arms in the background. So how do we interpret this data? When well, one possible explanation is the fact that perhaps some people just liked the extra protection that these would offer, even if it means having less maneuverability and mobility. I mean, if you think about it, people did wear wrappers and wrappers still kind of block your head. And whenever you look at medieval iconography, you see all sorts of preferences. You see people running into battle with a visor up. You see people fighting in a battle with no visor whatsoever. Some people choose to have open-faced helmets. So would it be really that strange that some people just said, hey, I want to survive this, so I want one of these. I can already hear people typing in the comments, yeah, but you can't move your head with one of these and you need to be able to look around and move your head left and right during a battle. Well, think about it this way. While it is true that later frog mouths tend to be either bolted to the cuirass or connected through leather straps, again, later frog mouths do that. Early frog mouths didn't really have this configuration and worked just like Wraith Elms. And even if you did own one of these later frog mouths, it's not like you have to connect it to your breastplate and backplate. What I'm trying to say is that if you do connect it to your breastplate and backplate, then the helmet will be sitting on your shoulders and you will have extra protection, full on rigidity. It's a good option, particularly for the joust. But if you want, and I've tried this with this one, if you put this helmet on your head and leave a little bit of a gap, and I want to thank Augusto for making me notice this, if you leave a little bit of a gap, the helmet will be suspended, similarly to how a bassinet is suspended on your head, and you will be able to still turn your head around, as long as you don't bolt it to the cuirass. You have this option. And this seems to be backed up by iconography. People did it. Now, of course, we can't be 100% sure. I'm not saying definitely people use these. The evidence is only iconographic, and we don't know if that was actually the case. But it is an interesting point to think about, and probably, in a similar way, we shouldn't really use definitive statements when it comes to precise dates. We probably also should be wary of definitive statements when it comes to saying frog mouths were only used for jousts. Now, with an armor, you can absolutely fight on horseback and on foot. What about a frog mouth? Well, technically, you can fight on foot with one of these. Not the best experience ever, but it's not impossible. Now, did people do it? Iconography seems to suggest that yes, it was also used occasionally on foot. But we also need to understand that we are still sort of far from being able to consider this a proven fact just because it's shown in iconography. But it is an interesting point to think about. I think deciding which helmet is the best option for you slash a medieval knight or man at arms very much depended also on what you were going to use it for. If I was going to go into a full-on, full contact joust, my personal preference would be a frog mouth over an armet. If I was a medieval nobleman and was called to fight in an actual battle, I would probably personally choose an armet or an armet with a wrapper. With that being said, it also has to do with what's going to happen, the tactical situation. If my king were to tell me, hey, Metatron, you're going to be in the very front line, in the very center, together with all the heavy armored guys. In that case, I think even if it was a battlefield, I might want to use one of these. And we do have evidence that the most heavily armored warriors, knights, and men at arms were put in the front. And as we look at iconography, that's where we sometimes see the frog mouth being used. So it could be a tactical choice, a case by case choice. And that could make sense also because medieval knights own several helmets. They had light helmets, they had heavy helmets. So a knight might own a frog mouth, an armet, a kettle hat, and maybe a couple of salads and bevers, and then decide what to wear depending on the tactical choices of his superiors. 
So is the frog mouth or the armet the best helmet? Very much depends on situational awareness and what you're going to use it for. But which one of these two is your personal favorite? Let me know in the comments below. Also, don't forget to take advantage of the special offer from World of Tanks, clicking the link in the description. Thank you very much for watching and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.